Well, the Japanese-Canadian Redress Legacy was an important follow-up to our initial book called Justice in Our Time. And that took us up to the time that there was an announcement in the House of Commons, the Redress Settlement. This book is a follow-up to it because as a result of the Redress Settlement, there was a community fund of $12 million. And there was an implementation fund of $3 million. And so we wanted to chronicle the activities of our community following the redress. And so th through this book, we were able to do that. I, I tried to uh, give a description of how the community came together in terms of uh, uh, mobilizing itself and helping the others to get uh, redress settlements. So we set up offices across the country. With the 12 million, we were able to uh, use the money to help rebuild the community. And that's why the title, uh, A Community Revitalized. And through that fund, we were able to increase the number of cultural centers in Canada from two up to 14. And so that's, and that goes across the country. Not only did it do that, but it allowed uh, our community to grow in terms of its knowledge, its history. We funded a number of museum projects. We funded a lot of activities within the community, bringing people together after the redress settlement, because that was so important to do. So the book is really a follow-up, and it's a record. And it's a record of all the documents, such as the acknowledgment, uh, the terms of the agreement, uh, also the work of the redress secretariat. So that's all in there. So if anyone's doing a little research, it has that kind of information. Well, when we first undertook the redress campaign, I think our d most difficult hurdle was to convince our own community, Japanese Canadians, that this was the right thing to do. There were a lot of fears within our community that as a result of us taking action to seek redress, that there would be a lot of backlash directed towards them, there'd be racism directed towards them, how would their neighbors feel when the community is asking for compensation? Those were all fears. And I think the other fear was the fact that we're such a small community, uh, not too many people had hope that this would ever get achieved anyway, so why would you make the effort? So those are the issues that we had to deal with initially. But once we got the campaign underway, uh, I think our media, the Canadian media, was very supportive. And it was through their articles, their uh, interviews of people, uh, their exposing what happened to Japanese Canadians, that even our community began to see, hmm, we're not the only ones involved here. Other people are thinking about it. And so we conducted things like a lot of community meetings, house meetings, to get Japanese Canadians together. And eventually, after two years, we felt that we had uh, a good support of Japanese Canadians, but it took that long for us to establish that support. Well, the whole redress movement, likely in, in Canada, began uh, quite early in um, 1977, during our centennial year. But I think what helped stimulate and facilitate that understanding within our own country was what was happening in the United States. In 1980, uh, the Congressional Congress established a committee that went across the country and they looked at what happened to Japanese Americans who were sent to uh, uh, concentration camps uh, in the uh, Western United States. As a result of those hearings and meetings across the country, they came up with a report. And the report recommended that Japanese Americans, because of their treatment, should receive compensation of $20,000. That took place in 1982, the report. By that time, our Canadian media kept asking, what are you doing in Canada? You were treated in a similar fashion. Why aren't you doing something? So, that stimulated our community to begin to hold meetings within uh, different centers about 
uh, the importance of redress, and we held a lot of community meetings to try to generate support. As I mentioned earlier, our community as a whole were not that supportive, but they knew that this is a beginning process. And so that helped us. And I think the second way the American uh, experience helped us is when uh, President Reagan signed the bill in 1988, August the 6th, giving Japanese Americans uh, not only uh, apology, but compensation on $20,000. That helped set, uh, us because we had been seeking individual compensation for the longest time, for four years, not going anywhere, and yet when that happened, it became a precedent that we can certainly go to our prime minister and say, look, there is a precedent. I remember uh, just shortly after the announcement, I sent a letter right away to the prime minister uh, reminding him what the Americans did, and now it's his turn to do the same. So it helped us in that respect. Well, I, I guess there were a number of lessons we learned from that experience. One is the importance of getting the media on your side, because I think they can make or break your issue. And uh, the media had been very supportive every place we went. Uh, I think they saw us as the underdog in fighting the government. And so from that respect, uh, we had lost support from the media. We were invited to, to talk place on it. Uh, uh, participate in talk shows and uh, television programs and so on. So all of that provided, uh, uh, I guess, knowledge, awareness to other Canadians, but also I think it helped our community realize that this was an issue not only about themselves, but that other people were thinking about. It. In other words, they weren't the only people who were uh, uh, just supporting us, that there were other people supporting us. So that was one important lesson that uh, came out of it. And uh, another lesson that I think is uh, important is the, uh, the fact that after four years, three years of getting nowhere, we had to change our strategy. And what we did is we made redress a Canadian human rights issue. Up to that point, it was looked upon what the Japanese community wanted from the Canadian government, trying to get an apology, et cetera. But when we changed the focus to say this is a Canadian issue, and what we did is we established a coalition and brought on other Canadians. So uh, Tom Berger, who's uh, Honorable Tom Berger, uh, well known in the legal system, became the honorary chair. And we had people like Pierre Burton, Margaret Atwood, all of those people joined in through Joy Kogawa. And uh, we had uh, politici other politicians who came on board, uh, professors, mayors of cities, who individually began to put their name to our coalition. Uh, eventually, we got most of the major unions in Canada, the large ones like the auto workers, the QP, and so on. Uh, and then we had all the major churches come on board to support us. So it was through that coalition building, and also a lot of the ethnic organizations uh, came on board as well. And so it was through that coalition that this issue became more of uh, a Canadian issue. And taking it out of our hands and broadening it, I think was the best strategy that we did. So I guess with anything else, you have to involve other Canadians uh, if you want to succeed. You can't do it by yourself. And we're such a small community. Uh, and we didn't have any political clout. We ha didn't have a single politician in our community, in the House of Commons. So we really didn't have the political clout. But we had the ability to bring people together. And I think that was a thing that really helped us. Well, I've always felt I belong to Canada. <laughs> uh, I was born here. Uh, my parents were born in Canada. Uh, it was my grandparents who came here very early. 
So my sense of Canadian was fairly strong. But then when I got involved with the redress movement, uh, on so many occasions people would, especially if they were angry at us, would say to me, why don't you come back or go back where you came from? Very common statement. And I always say, well, it's pretty hard for me to do. I'm already there. <laughs> that type of reaction. But again, seeing us as visible minorities, I think a lot of people saw it looked upon us as immigrants, not recognizing that we're into our third, fourth, fifth generation in this country. And so my sense of identity, I think, uh, has never really faltered in terms of who I was. But I think for many people in my community, uh, they didn't want to identify that strongly as Japanese because of the treatment, because they were discriminated upon. In fact, there were people in our community uh, who changed her name to a non-Japanese name, although you can't change her face, but they were able to do that. Or they would uh, deny language. For instance, uh, many of our third, fourth generation Japanese have no clue of speaking Japanese. I don't speak Japanese. And so that's, I think, one effect that it had too, where you begin to deny parts of your heritage. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, I think I've always had a very strong allegiance to being a Canadian in my mind, but maybe not in other people's minds. So <laughs> that's the way it's sort of uh, looked upon. Well, I know that the Canadian Race Relations Foundation was a very important component of our redress settlement. And part of the reason was that we felt it was important is because when we were trying to do the redress uh, movement and research, when we asked government to help us with research, uh, they turned us down. They said, why would we help you when you would use the research against us? And that's when we recognized as a small community, we really didn't have a place to turn to. And so we said to ourselves, you know, there's got to be a foundation or some place that other Canadians could turn to. And so the concept of the foundation came. And that was essentially to help other people who are facing injustices, provide research money for them, or have the ability to show them how to lobby, that type of thing. So that's the original concept. Where are we today? Well, we have different kinds of issues in Canadian society. Uh, I think the uh, foundation is still a very important component of combating uh, those injustices that are taking place. Uh, the shift now is uh, not on Japanese, but it could be on other people, uh, especially the religious kinds of conflicts that are occurring. Uh, but the foundation needs to play a role in trying to help mediate that or at least uh, educating uh, Canadians about the issues. And so from that perspective, I think the foundation still has a very important role to play. I think multiculturalism, uh, I think uh, Maybe we even have to look at that concept of multiculturalism. Yes, we have many cultures that coexist in our country, and that's important, but I think it has to go beyond coexistence. It has to go uh, to appreciation of each other's, uh, appreciating diversity that people bring. And I guess the thing that I'm finding, uh, I, I teach at the university, or I was teaching students uh, who were going to become teachers. And I realized that uh, as I met with my classes, uh, the course was on multiculturalism. They knew the concept of diversity and so on, but they had very little knowledge of the past history of different groups and what they have to struggle through in order to gain where we are today. And so I think when you talk about multiculturalism, you need to also talk about the past history of what people and how the evolution took place. And I think that's the part that we're often missing. And so when I ask 
students about uh, Japanese Canadian internment, maybe uh, four or five percent have heard about it. If you ask about the Chinese tags, very few people. And so I'm realizing that uh, although we promote a multiculturalism, uh, there's a component that seems to be lost, which is looking at why did we have to move into that position. And so that's a part that uh, we need to work on. There are many Canadian values that I think are important. The sense of belonging, I think, is important. Uh, respect for other people's cultures, uh, other people's heritage, way of life. Uh, I think those are uh, very strong values that we have, appreciation for each other, um, and also being able to communicate with each other. It's not good enough to uh, listen, but you have to make some inroads in actually meeting people. And I think that's the best way to understand someone, is to actually talk to them and, uh, and hear about their story, and you have a deeper appreciation for it. So. I think those are some important values. When I was a citizenship judge, and I made a lot of people Canadians, I would say, you know, your primary responsibility is not only uh, respecting other people's cultures and that, the, the important part is that you get out and vote. That that's in a democratic society, that's your voice. And if you don't use your voice, then you're not really participating fully. And so I think voting is like a, you know, the most important part of uh, your sense of Canadian. Yeah. I often think, too, that uh, we should send young people to a different country for six months, I, I used to run a program where we used to have interns uh, in the Caribbean, and I would send them for half a year, and then they would come back. And I found that the majority of them, when they came back, were very proud that they were Canadian, because they then recognized what we have in the country that other people don't have. And uh, I think uh, we could make a lot of young people appreciate their country, if we sent them overseas for a half a year someplace, and it'd be money wor well worth spent uh, to develop that. Well, you know, one of the things that people say, uh, have you done sort of an autobiography manuscript? Well, you know, I ha I've written it up, but I've never really gotten to a point of publishing it because I've had it edited a few times, and then uh, I have to do all the reference checks, and I, it, it sort of feels so cumbersome that you never get around to it. My daughter said maybe she'll do it, but at this point in time, no, I don't have any plans. It sounds like too much work for me, but, uh, uh, but I do speak a lot even now. Uh, just last week, I was attending an internment conference in Winnipeg, and we spoke about the Japanese-Canadian experience there. Uh, there's a project at the University of Victoria called Landscapes of Injustice on Japanese Canadians. So I was there uh, uh, as an advisory committee uh, looking at you know, their research and so on. So I keep involved, uh, especially with this issue. And I'm a, a guest lecturer at the U of Winnipeg on this topic as well. So that's enough busyness for me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs>